thank you, Harry, for the invitation and uh, thank you for the work you are doing, John Bennett. It's tremendous work for us, for all of us, and it's uh, really in favor of the neurosurgeon all over the world. I will not entirely speak uh, in my brief introduction about uh, only about uh, the new study, but also about uh, where we are in the world uh, for neurosurgery. I represent uh, the World Federation, who is uh, about 49,000, let's say, around 50,000 neurosurgeons from 130 societies all over the world. The main mission, mission is to improve neurosurgical care through training and research. And uh, you know that uh, we all know what's going on. In uh, 2015, uh, The Lancet uh, wrote a Maidstone paper about global surgery. Until uh, 2015, all the money for countries uh, in development, or uh, let's say low and middle income countries was going were targeted to communicable disease and uh, many others, infective disease, HIV, all of these kind of issues because uh, they thought that surgery was extremely expensive and not fitting for developing these countries. After this paper, it was identified that something like 5 billion people all over the world are in need of uh, proper surgery and cannot get it, which is even more than that about infective and transmissible disease. So uh, neurosurgery actually it's uh, in part or even in one important part of these uh, new surgical efforts. We have uh, four listed surgeries within the competence of the new global surgery, which are uh, basically surgery for trauma and surgery, both uh, brain and spine trauma and surgery for hydrocephalus. So we are part of this global effort to improve surgery in countries with low and middle income. If we look at the paper published, you can see it here, the word the global neurosurgery was not there until 2016. Then, through the effort of many neurosurgeons like Key Park, Abruzzo, <coughs> many and ourselves as well, the number of publications increased. And I am pleased to tell you that last year we had more than 25 publications targeted uh, to global, what we call it, global neurosurgery. Where is the, the disparity? The disparity is here. You see, this is the number of available neurosurgeons all around the world. And you see that uh, Southeast Asia and Africa are in lack of a good number of neurosurgeons. This is the, the ranking of the neurosurgeon per population. On the extreme right here, you see Japan. Here you have USA, Brazil, and all Europe is somewhere situated here, whereas the poorest country are there with very limited number of neurosurgeons available, as you see. But even more important, this is a very important paper, is about children, but uh, it concerns all of us. Uh, these are the available instruments to do surgery in different areas of the world. And you see that in low income and low middle income countries, there is very little available instruments here. And only one part of the world, the high income country, have almost everything. I would say almost, because apart from United States, even Europe has some problems in some part of our work, like epilepsy and cerebrovascular surgery. So, Apart from the number of neurosurgeons, the, the number of available instruments varies a lot among different parts. Basically, there are two parts of the world. Our part, which is called the Western part, where we do have uh, to play with these beautiful new microscopes, uh, the esoscopes, or whatever you want. 
And another part of the world, these are uh, two colleagues who are operating in Africa for charity in Benin, and they are using the telephone as a microscope. Uh, this has also been published recently by our colleagues in India. Uh, the same, the use of telephone for magnification. So, or you see it here, we have beautiful tools like OARM, intraoperative CT scan, anything, HIRO, anything to use, uh, to be used uh, in, in trajectory for pedicle screws like here, or in some parts of the world, we need steel frames and wires. So the approach to the same operation is very different in different parts of the world. I just escaped this, which is too complicated, but I ask you to read this paper and to see how, is, how big is the world of neurosurgery. These are uh, 13 million of neurosurgical operation per year that we are doing all around the world. And you will be surprised to see how important are traumatic brain injury and traumatic spinal cord injury and even stroke as compared to what we think it's a common way of operating like epilepsy surgery or, or brain tumors and so on. So just look at this paper to see how big is the world and how different is the world. Obviously, we need to improve this situation, but how can we do it? That's the issue. We are, as World Federation, we have founded a foundation who can support education of neurosurgeons all around the world. We have three programs. We, one is the full postgraduate training center, which means that the, the students, the doctors, can be trained for five years for the full period. Then we have what we call short period training center for one month to six months training all around the world. In Africa, we had quite a number of centers who can train African neurosurgeons in Africa with the, with the help, economical help of the World Federation. And you see that uh, together with many other centers and the efforts of many others uh, programs and African neurosurgeons, the number of neurosurgeons was moved in sub-Saharan Africa from one to eight million to one for two million in 2016, a four times increase in the number of neurosurgeons, which clearly are not enough yet, but they are improved. And, Another issue that we always forget is advocacy. We need the, the people to know about what we are doing. This is a paper published in Kenya about the first time where brain surgery was done in a peripheral hospital in Kenya. And this is a bridge between uh, uh, Bandung in Indonesia and New Guinea where the there is a new neurosurgical unit starting to operate. So we need uh, to help our colleagues to start and work. So apart from that, we are organizing courses all around the world. This is uh, an endoscopy course. These are 3D cinema lectures, very, very important uh, new initiatives. This is a Congress on Neurotrauma where we have uh, supported the, the participation of, of uh, students from all over the world. This is a WFS symposium in Kenya, and these are the educational uh, training course that we are doing. I just go through very quickly. You see it here in, in Togo and everywhere. Another way of education is the one we are having now today. It's uh, the use of the web for uh, education, which is extremely important in countries where uh, going to a meeting or going to a course is, uh, from the economical point of view, difficult to, to achieve. So we, are, uh, we have recently published a full review together with our colleagues of BrainBook uh, a full review of what the digital teaching can be helpful to low and middle income countries. And uh, as you have seen here, there are quite a lot in the web of uh, 
this is the one where we are now, the neurosurgical TV, but there are many others uh, tools that we can use from the web to improve the education of our young neurosurgeons and the webinars that we have done through the World Federation and this webinar is today and the, the webinars organized by the Asian neurosurgery like today from many of you including Hypecherian <coughs> and many others who are uh, Professor Kato who is the, uh, the mother of all these issues and uh, I think this is extremely important. Uh, this is a simulator for the phone that uh, we have organized in Europe together with the European community and is uh, freely available for all of you for neurosurgical uh, simple approaches. There is a weakness that we all have to know about internet learning. Internet learning has no quality control in some sites. Uh, whenever we see a surgical procedure, we have to be aware that in the internet, uh, there is no surgical approach curve. So remember that whenever you want uh, to uh, do a surgical approach, you always remember a learning curve who is not there. And we need clearly a place where we have to display these uh, kind of webinars and the web-based education approved. What we know is that, uh, and I'm going to finish with my presentation, if we look at the numbers, for instance, of brain injury, we see that these are the most uh, uh, frequent uh, brain injury in different countries. You see South America, Mexico, Africa, uh, this part of Southeast Asia. These are the countries with more trauma and these are the countries who are publishing about trauma and you see that the world is reverse. What uh, the part of the world who is publishing is the part of the world who is less of this disease. And this is coming because from low and middle income countries, we only have something like 4.9% of everything who is published. So less than 5% is published by a group of people of countries where we have about 40% of the world population. And if we look about what is published from these countries, you see that most is brain tumor. Uh, and brain tumor is not the, the top uh, surgery that they are doing in terms of uh, quantity. So uh, it's also a reflection of what we want from, from them, and what is feasible to publish in our peer-reviewed papers. And these are the most publishing countries in the world. And you see that only India, who is a low middle income countries, is among the first 15. So, most of what is published is coming from uh, United States, China, Japan, and Europe, most. Uh, and even more important, uh, if we look at the most uh, cited papers, so citation index, uh, then we have a clear prevalence of the United States followed by Europe. So basically, if we look at the most uh, cited papers, we have only two parts of the world. Uh, United States and Europe. What does it mean? That whenever we generate uh, through evidence-based uh, medicine guidelines for management of everything, this is the guidelines for, uh, for uh, um, high-income countries, you see that this uh, evidence-based is generated only in one part of the world. So whenever we want to cure a patient in uh, let's say in South Saharan Africa, we have to cure it if we follow the guidelines according to guidelines who are generated in North America and Europe, where the situation is clearly, obviously, very much different. So the solutions are clearly, we have no intervention is possible without data. That's why NIOS is so important. And no improvement is possible without the knowledge of the local facilities. And uh, is, these are number of papers published by European and American university together with African neurosurgeons. And you see that this uh, 
one of these experiences, those one, uh, the experience done in, in uh, Uganda by the Benjamin Worf group and the Uganda group uh, reach uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. So the global neurotrauma outcome study is extremely important in the way of getting education and in the way of getting data from all over the world and keeping us uh, aware of what is the possibility to treat the patient with the traumatic and injuries in so different countries. And uh, as, you, as we have done recently with Peter Atkinson and other colleagues, another issue is involving uh, colleagues from countries who have uh, limited uh, facility, but a large number of trauma in our publications. And as you see, it, this example is a combination of Western University together with Colombia, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, and so on. So we need, uh, basically, we need to work together. And just to finish, this is the bridge in Rome, one of the oldest bridges we have. It's, uh, it's a Middle Age bridge built up on a, on a Roman bridge. And we need uh, that on one side of the bridge are the Western countries, Europe, US, Australia, Japan, China, and everything. On that part of the bridge are the countries in need, and we need to connect them with all the possibility we have. This uh, we are doing today is one possibility, like education via web, we have to invest resources, we have to collect data, we have to publish data, and we have to suggest the intervention. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Franco. Um, any questions or comments from the panel? We have a very big panel today. We have with us Professor Ignatius Azini, the chair of the Young African Society of Neurosurgeons. Could you please shed some light on Professor Franco's talk and your opinions about that? Yeah, yeah thank you so much. I'm actually, I'm not a professor yet. I'm okay. hoping to be a professor soon. So actually, it was a really nice presentation for Professor Franco. And um, actually, I just finished my training in Cairo in the U.S. and then I returned to Cameroon. And uh, what Professor Franco has been saying is what we are finding on the ground. In, uh, for example, in Cameroon, we have about uh, 20 neurosurgeons. And uh, most of them are located within the major cities. So there's a problem of quantity, and then there's another problem of geographical distributions of the neurosurgeons. So even though there are few, the few that are available are only located in the urban centers. So you find all the rural areas having a lack of neurosurgeons. So this is a general trend which you will find across Africa. And uh, the second point he raised was uh, about the Nuken that showed that uh, uh, they were just about 0.3% of the publications in, in, in the Neurosurgery Journal, Journal of Neurosurgery and ACTA that were from Africa. So this also comes, again, to corroborate what he's saying, that even though most of the publications are coming from the developed countries, the guidelines are based on this evidence, and we have to apply them in the, in the developing countries. So we in the developing countries actually need to step up in the... Uh, publication and that's actually what we are doing at the level of the young African neurosurgeons. We've been that's why we also uh, uh, encourage most of the young neurosurgeons to uh, participate in this study, especially the, uh, the, the global neurotrauma outcome study. And we also encourage them in other many multi center studies because this is also going to help to provide data about Africa. And as, as you can notice, there's basically no data about Africa in most of the websites. So I'm sure in the next coming years, we are going to provide a lot of data for Africa. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments from the panel? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, yes, Manuel, please. Um, Can you nice please you. introduce yourself and then proceed? Uh, yes. Um, my name is Manuel. I'm from Dominican Republic. Right now, I am in Moscow. I am resident of neurosurgery. Uh, buon pomeriggio, professore. Buon Thank you. Grazie. Grazie. Uh, uh, io sono andato a Napoli uh, l'anno scorso. It's Professor Capabianca. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is, for example, I came from um, Dominican Republic. We are now in Dominicana. They are like 60 or 70 neurosurgeons. But for example, 
almost maybe 50 of them, more than the 70% is in the capital, in Santo Domingo. There is like uh, in the border with Gaiti, uh, we have um, five cities and around that cities and other, and other ones, and they don't have uh, neurosurgeons, nothing at all, nothing at all. So the people from the borders, I work on, in the border um, one year, the people from the border with uh, head trauma, um, and if they need to see a neurosurgeon, they need to go 300 kilometers for the public neurosurgeon. Because in the private, they can get, but still it's like 200 kilometers in other cities. And in a few, few, very few um, hospitals in my country, they don't have like even microscope, for example, and don't even talk about endoscope. So what the um, uh, World for the Rest of Neurosurgical Society can do from that kind of country, for example, because we are a poor country and very few neurosurgeons. Uh, well, this is an issue that if you go to the website of the World Federation and you click over a country now, since I think one year, we are working on uh, uh, accessibility, meaning how, 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 which part of the population of that country has access to neurosurgery within an hour, which is important because, as you said, in many countries in the world, even in many countries with low and middle income, the number of neurosurgeons may be enough, but they all are in the same area. There are no neurosurgeons outside this area. And this is a problem which can be solved only, I think, through education in the country. Uh, there are countries who are putting now uh, efforts to, let's say, when the educated neurosurgeon, the young one, come back, they are almost obliged to go for three years in rural areas and not to stay in the central areas. In China, I know that now in many areas of China, it's almost mandatory that you have to pass two, three years over there. But this is something that is difficult because if you want to send someone there, you need instrument, as you say, you need microscope. You cannot send the people to operate without anything. It is a complex issue. We are starting to work on that. And if you click, for instance, on Republica Dominicana on our website, I have done it now, you have a map with colors which tell you where are the neurosurgeons and which are the areas where you, we don't have neurosurgeons. This is something to start with, to know how we, how we see it in single countries and then intervene, but this is difficult. I agree with you. This is another issue. In some countries, we don't have enough neurosurgeons. In some countries, we have, but they are all in the same area. You're right. For example, in my personal experience in 2004, I remember a friend of my family, he had a head trauma in a motorcycle. Um, that was, and he need to, he was in a, in a city called San Juan, and he, they, they, um, he need to go to the capital because there was no neurosurgery in all that area. And of course, unfortunately he died because it was like uh, 200 kilometers well, we need to involve the politicians to understand that we need the neurosurgery spread all over the country, not concentrated. But remember, it's not only a problem of politician. Sometimes the neurosurgeon like to be where is the money, I tell you clearly. Yeah, no, yes. In yes, yes. the capital, they want to work there. That's, we can understand it. So we have to find a system that the youngest one will pass part of their education and stay in remote areas. That's the only way, in my opinion. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, comments? Professor Cherian, would you like to add some comments to Professor Frankel's talk? Yes, I have comment about Professor Franco. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, Hello, good morning, everybody. I am Nordin uh, Adene Rabonkole. Yeah, I, I can am resident, uh, 
I am a resident uh, in uh, WFNS uh, Center, uh, reference center in Rabat, in Morocco. Uh, I'm so glad to, to meet you again, uh, Professor Franco Saverde. I was, uh, I met you last time in uh, Marrakesh. Um, okay. Last right. time, and it's pleasure to me to. Yes, it's very nice to. It's very nice to me uh, to meet you again today, and uh, I would uh, really uh, I would want to thank you for all you've done for young neurosurgeon in uh, in Africa. Uh, we know we know now since uh, many years that you've done big big effort to to keep uh, to keep up and uh, to keep up African young neurosurgeon and to help uh, to help us uh, to to go in together further. And uh, I would like to thank you very much. And um, uh, we, we young neurosurgeons, we, uh, we have now, um, uh, we, we, we now our, our um, I don't know how I can explain that, but uh, we know that we have one challenge today. And this challenge is uh, to, uh, to be strong between us in Africa and uh, save life about our population mm -hmm. and uh, do all uh, our best to treat uh, in our country all pathology about neuro uh, about neurosurgery like uh, vascular pathology tumoral pathology uh, pediatric neurosurgery um, all these pathology uh, we know that today to fix this challenge to treat our own population in know, our right. country. Not need to not need to 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 done to 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 done uh, <coughs> transport uh, uh, or transfer to another country. So we we um, we are working together to attend and to achieve this goal and uh, we know now we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, okay. we can trust on you and uh, you are really really here to help us and uh, i would like to say really thanks you and uh, we are on the same way thank you very much professor franco now th thank you for working with us uh, i have to thank you Thank you very much. We we'll see us soon in Tanja. Yes, yes, Thank I know, in June. <laughs> in June. Yes, yes, correct. You're welcome, Professor. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll just take one more question and then we'll move on to the next. Uh, we have Dr. Ulrich with us. He's also from Africa and he has some few points to raise. Please uh, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, Ulrich Sidney, a final year medical student and future research associate at Harvard. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Professor. Um, just a few comments about the, 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 the lack of research from low and middle income countries. I would like to suggest that there should be more programs from the WFNS, yeah, the Young African Neurosurgeons, to help students to participate as well. Because I believe the earlier we get um, immersed into research, the better it will be. Then the second thing is, um, usually African researchers and neurosurgeons don't have access to the same kind of funds that their high-income high country counterparts will have access to. So that's another issue we, we need to, to address. And uh, the publishers, usually they accept fancy granular research, whereas in Africa, we still, we're still, for most of our research, at a very basic Kind of research. So when a neurosurgeon comes up with an article, usually he's do he doesn't have the ease to publish into, say, ACTA or neurosurgery and all the other uh, big um, uh, reviews. And then finally, I'd like to congratulate the initiative from WFNS, but particularly from the Young African Neurosurgeons, uh, via Dr. Estene Ignatius. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, just to give you a last comment, you're right. I mean, you're right in many we need to, to have a share of fundings and we need to understand that if we want, i give you an example, if we want to publish guidelines, we cannot go ahead like we have done now. We have to invest some money to involve our colleagues from Africa and East Asia to work with us and investing the money that we are investing for the process of evidence-based 
would be enough to have some of you working with us. We need, we need to work together. We cannot separate the world into two parts. That's, uh, you are right. We, we need, the funding is an issue. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's Peter Hutchinson from Cambridge. I'm going to do this without the, the video because the, uh, the internet connection may not be so reliable. So can everybody see the first slide? Yes, we can see that. Perfect. OK, yeah. so here, thank you for, uh, for organising this webinar. Um, fantastic. So uh, following on from Professor Serverday, I'm going to uh, provide an update on the work of the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. So as we know, uh, brain trauma is a pathway for a patient from the scene of an accident through emergency hospital care, operations, intensive care, rehabilitation and reintegration into the community, and is the commonest cause of death under the age of 40 years in high income countries. But what we're now increasingly aware of that this is actually a very big problem in the low and middle income countries who experience nearly three times more cases of traumatic brain injury than the high income countries. In fact, increasing incidence of one of the major causes of traumatic brain injury, road injury, is now the eighth commonest cause of death globally, and trauma causes 5 million deaths per day on the planet, equivalent to 14,000 deaths uh, per day uh, globally. And by uh, 2030, it is thought that road injury deaths will rise to the fifth commonest cause of death globally. We tend to focus very much on the treatment of traumatic brain injury, but actually to make a big impact, we probably need to focus more on prevention. This is uh, Lawrence of Arabia, who died in 1934 on his motorcycle. And then to the right, we have Sir Hugh Cairns, who introduced motorcycle helmets during the Second World War. And that's made a big difference in the high income countries, but there are still many countries in the world where helmets are not worn. If we look at outcome from severe head injury, what kills people is hypoxia and hypotension. And if we're gonna really make an impact in terms of the treatment, I think we need to begin by addressing these issues in addition to neurosurgical intervention. So ensuring that oxygen and a good blood pressure is delivered to the patients. And that needs to begin very early at the scene of the incident, and particularly in terms of pre-hospital care. And there's been a very encouraging and interesting initiative from India where the National Highways Authority will soon deploy an ambulance, a highway patrol vehicle and a crane every 50 kilometers across their network in order to get medical care to road traffic accident victims more quickly. <coughs> so that, that leads us on to the Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. So the UK uh, government have signed up to 0.7% of, uh, of national expenditure on official development or overseas development assistance, the ODA. And much of this money is being spent through the National Institute for Health Research. That is the research branch of the National Health Service. So in 2017, we established with the NIHR, the Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. It was launched in Cambridge and the website there is neurotrauma.world. And we argued for the creation of the group on the basis that traumatic injury is increasing worldwide with the greatest increase in low and middle income countries. And neurological injury is one of the most catastrophic and good quality care is complex. And there is an argument that improvements in care need to be supported by high quality data. So the group has a number of international partners. 
who were involved in the uh, original application, but an increasing number of other partners through the GENOS study. And in particular, a collaboration with supporting organizations, so the WFNS, many international organizations, and most recently uh, with WHO. The group has four themes. Theme one, mapping traumatic brain injury care. Two is understanding traumatic brain injury care. Three is innovation in traumatic brain injury care. And four is building uh, research capacity. The GENOS study fits within theme one, mapping TBI care. And we are aiming for an online registry endorsed by the WFNS to understand the volume, case mix and neurosurgical practice of patients with traumatic brain injury within the partnership of the group, but also around the world. I will just present Genos very briefly, then Dr. David Clark will uh, present where we are in terms of an update in more detail. So emergency surgery for TBI was recognized by the Lancet Commission, as Professor Servaday talked about, and intracranial hematoma evacuation is one of the should do uh, surgical procedures. Genos aims for the first time to provide a comprehensive picture of the management and outcome of patients undergoing emergency cranial surgery after a TBI worldwide, the objective being to compare outcomes for emergency surgery between high and low human development index countries. Any hospital in the world can participate, any hospital that performs emergency cranial surgery. This is a multi-center prospective observational study. And we are trying to collect one month of data, a consecutive 30 day period between October 2018 and October 2019. The outcome measures a 14 day mortality, return to the operating theater during the follow-up period, length of stay in hospital, length of stay in intensive care, data on infections, and the Glasgow Community Discharge. GENOS that David will present later is a snapshot of one month of data, but we are hoping this will be a prelude to GOTBI, which will be an international registry of traumatic brain injury. So that is theme one. I will briefly mention the other themes that are part of the Global Neurotrauma Group. Theme two is understanding traumatic brain injury care. This is using a systems engineering approach to model current practice and how we could make a change in order to improve treatment and outcome. And this is being led by a member of the group, Dr. Tom Bashford, and is run with a number of partners, but predominantly through Myanmar and Yangon General Hospital. And what theme two involves is identifying stakeholders and their needs, looking at the elements in a system, what are the interactions, how we can model current practice, and then how we can model a change in that practice would impact on improving uh, outcome for patients. Theme three is new innovations and new technology that are appropriate to improving the management of patients, particularly system optimization, risk stratification, surgical intervention, and trying to address the challenge of long-term outcome data collection. So what are some of the technologies we're currently looking at? So if you look at the evolution of technology to investigate intracerebral hematomas, we have CT scans in hospital, fixed CT scans have become mobile, for example, the Seratom scanner now can be placed in an ambulance, but can we move towards more simple devices that can be used in the pre-hospital environment? For example, the infra scanner. This is something that the group is uh, currently evaluating. We know that intracranial pressure is related to outcome from patients. It is routinely used in many centers uh, throughout the planet, 
but can we actually measure intracranial pressure without having to put invasive drains or probes in the brain? And the group, Chiara Robber, has looked at using ultrasound as a non-invasive measurement of intracranial pressure. How do we do that? By measuring the optic nerve sheath diameter. And what we've shown is a good relationship between the optic nerve sheath diameter and the intracranial pressure. Ultrasound machines historically have been large and expensive, but with modern technology, the Philips Lumify, we can have a handheld, relatively cheap ultrasound scanner connected uh, to a smartphone for its display. The UK government have also set up the Surgical Technology Evaluation Portal, STEP, collaboration between the NHS, the Brain Injury MedTech Cooperative, and the Royal College of Surgeons of England to try and create new devices in terms of technology evaluation to assist in the investigation and management of patients. And if anybody has any ideas for new technology, uh, we will be delighted to hear from them. Finally, theme four is about building research capacity, output and training. So a plan to currently map research capacity and output and address this discrepancy in terms of where brain injury is happening compared to where brain injury uh, publications are emerging. And some examples, this is a project run uh, out of Malaysia with um, Professor Vikness Warren, who is using telemedicine to try and manage patients remote parts of Malaysia without having to transfer them to a neurosurgical unit. Other examples are the uh, utilization of research through randomized controlled trial technologies. So this is uh, the Rescue ASDH study, a randomized study of decompressive craniectomy versus craniotomy for acute subdural hematomas. And this has been a major international effort. It is just a close to recruitment, recruited over 460 patients. And what's fantastic about this study is the major contribution made by the lower middle income countries, such that Nimhans Hospital in Bangalore was the largest randomization of patients. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in Cambridge, but many people further afield, the low and middle income country partners. Also, the funders for this work, particularly the National Institute for Health Research, who have funded the group. We had a meeting in Birmingham last week looking at some of the outputs from the various groups, and, and uh, the UK government are encouraged in terms of the, the progress of our group, uh, and hopefully will will enable us to continue flourish and grow more studies over the next uh, few years. So that is uh, globalneurotrauma.com. David will talk about it more, but please uh, join Genos. Please put more patients in any 30-day period between the 1st of October 2018 and the 1st of October 2019. If anybody has any questions, uh, very happy to take them now, or please email me at pjah2 at cam.ac.uk. And again, uh, thank you to Hera for the invitation. And thank you for John for all his assistance with the, with the technology. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. One, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I can comment on the technology. Uh, it's uh, 5G wireless is obviously the direction. And I just want to show you an example. Can you see this? Uh, let me let me let me get my cell phone. Uh, can you see this uh, machine here? Uh, no, John. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I'm just throwing this technology here. All right. <laughs> okay. At any rate, uh, let me see here. Should I should I come off the share screen? Would that be helpful? Yeah, you, you're yeah, already off the. So. He's already off the screen. I'm off the screen now. Yeah. 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 Here. Yeah. Okay. At any rate, let me just explain. It's uh, the their wireless uh, diagnostic devices is a wireless uh, device that hooks to a smartphone that you can project a screen on a white wall for for see webinars like this. Yes. And fantastic. the same thing applies to imaging studies. 
uh, with the smartphone and the ultrasound, those devices are going to get stronger, especially in areas which of low bandwidth. That's just the one remark I want to make. And thank you, Professor. No, no, thank you. Thank you so Anybody much. Anybody have any questions? Anybody has any questions or comments? Yes, Professor Tarek, please. Hi, hi. Um, just want hi, to Tarek. Make a comment. Hi. Just want to make a comment. I think it's an, an, an amazing venture which uh, you people have got together. Uh, I've always been thinking of trying to develop a neurotrauma registry. And I think going international is the way to go. I think it will make a huge difference. And what we talk about not having uh, papers coming out of the lower and middle income countries, I think this is going to solve a lot of problems. Um, and I'm thankful to you and your Cambridge colleagues for that. And, uh, Tarek, and thank you for your tremendous support through the WFNS Neurotron Committee in terms, of, in terms of spreading the message, particularly about GNOS. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Introduce oh, yourself, my, please. My name is uh, Elam. I'm a Elam. young neurosurgeon. Yeah. Uh, I'm, current, I'm an Ethiopian and currently working in Malawi, uh, helping out a friend here. So, for example, here, uh, we don't have a CT scan in the main hospital, but rather we have in the private setups. Yes. So we have two neurosurgeons here who are fully equipped with knowledge, but uh, at some point we are actually handicapped because of the lack of the CT scan and yeah, sure. most of the patients wouldn't afford that. And I like the idea of this optic sheet, uh, optic nerve sheet, the diameter measurement, and also yeah. you can get the infra scanner whereby it helps at least for now, for the time being, to identify where the hematoma location is. Yeah. And uh, we are trying our best, even clinically, to do decompressive craniotomies, uh, whereby if they have any anisocoria and uh, weakness of one extremities. But we are also interested in uh, getting involved with this uh, global uh, uh, neurosurgery uh, data collection, at least for one month. But without having the CT scan, it will be a very few cases whereby we will not have adequate cases to show what our actual potential is. Because most of the time we'll just keep them admitted in the ICU for a few days and then keep them sedated and then discharge them. So how, can, how do you think we can come about with this oh, uh, solution so for a minor, uh, for yeah. this short period of time? So two things. So the first is we'd be de delighted to try and help you get some of these technologies. So okay. maybe if you could email me afterwards and we'll, we have a group meeting on Monday and we'll see if okay. we can get you more involved in the group. Okay. The second is if you are operating on patients with head and traumatic brain injury, which you are doing, even without a CT scanner, then you can still put those patients in the GNOS study. Okay. So you don't have to have a CT scan to go, but providing you're performing the surgery. And I think that would be really valuable data for, okay. you know, to know that surgery is going on without a CT scanner. But we'd, we'd be happy to, to help try and get this, some of this, this technology into, into Malawi. Okay. We'll be very delighted because yeah. like most of the time we'll have this, uh, we, we're not sure if we should have, should go and operate on some of the cases. Sure. Because it, you might end up with just having a small contusion or a, uh, on, it, on just a diffuse axonal injury. So that's the trouble that we are having. Sometimes for some of our patients, we send them for a private, but for most uh, people here, they yes. cannot afford uh, having a CT scan in a private setup. No, I, I Maybe $150. So, yeah. but... We are working on uh, trying to get the CT scan for the hospital, but you know the uh, bureaucracy and the politics in each uh, places. But I think uh, if we try to get maybe the optic sheet and uh, nerve diameter uh, access and also in the infra scanner somehow it, may help. It, I it, think. it will be a start, and then and then and then to try and get the the, the pressure to. I mean, the mobile CT scanner, the Seratom, is very good, and it's. Okay cheaper than a you know putting in a a, a fixed ct screen but uh, I, I think it would be good to start with some of the more bedside technologies yeah yeah please email me okay sure thing i will email thank you okay i've shared his email address in the chat box 
Um, can we have uh, any further? Yes, Professor Julian. Yeah. Hey, Tariq. Good to see you, John. All of you. So good to see you guys. Uh, you know, one of the things that is uh, that has to be really highlighted as since we are neurosurgeons is uh, what are the advances in neurosurgery per se? Not in ICU management, not in registries, not in data collection, but what is the management in surgical technique that has come over the last hundred years? How are we adapting? How are we adopting that into trauma neurosurgery? There's one thing we have to highlight because, you know, trauma is, uh, they say trauma is emergent and the neurosurgeon, uh, senior neurosurgeons are not. That is a, a sad fact. So trauma has come at 2 a.m. in the morning. So it is a convenient thing that uh, you know, residents all over the world, it is not a secret that it is the residents, the junior most people that is doing trauma. So it is not enough to just collect the data and uh, uh, see what is happening. It is also that we should press. I mean, Franco, is Franco here? We should uh, no, tell people. I think he does and see what can be done. And uh, that doesn't need too much of an infrastructure. I mean, uh, for me, as far as uh, Nepal is concerned, we are, uh, I'm located in one of the most poorest countries. One of the most poorest. Nepal, if you see, one of the most poorest. And uh, I can proudly say that we probably will have uh, more facilities than any of you sitting out there. I mean, uh, including Adam Brooks. We have interoperative three Tesla. We have everything. And this doesn't come into play with the trauma. Trauma, you need just a microscope and uh, I mean, a CT scan and a microscope, that is all you need and a good surgeon. So you don't need all this fancy equipment for trauma. I, for the last 10 years, what we have done in Nepal, we really don't need all this fancy. It just needs the correct mindset that uh, neurosurgeons should not avoid trauma as something secondary. Anybody who says aneurysm should say trauma in the same breath, not as something else. As uh, Professor Hutchison said, if you look at proportionals, low, low and middle income countries have much more. But if you look at the absolute numbers, it's sure the number of, uh, the number of head injuries in low and middle income uh, countries, you know, the population is five, six there. The population of low and middle income countries are five, six. So we are looking at three times more head injuries in five six of the population. So the people here, the neurosurgeons here, they will have to look at what neurosurgical advances we have to look, we have to see. Now things are slowly changing. And uh, instead of looking at, I mean, a CT scan is not very difficult in any country. CT scan is not very difficult in this era. I understand. So I am, I'm not speaking from a very high and mighty situation in Nepal. You must know it's uh, how poor people are, but we can get CT scans. We can get a microscope. The WFNS will help us for that, even in some countries. So let us have the right mindset and then we'll be okay. Tari, what do you have to say, Tari? Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Go ahead. Definitely, definitely uh, it's, it's trauma, and I'm so glad that neuro trauma is slowly started taking back its center stage because I, we all know that more than 60% of, of neurosurgical work is neuro trauma. Um, and obviously, we need a mindset. And yes, we have to train the juniors on neuro trauma, but it should not be left all to the trainees. These consultants have to be available and they have to help the young neurosurgeons practice. And that is why when you discuss regarding cystinostomies, I tell everybody that first of all, you must learn microsurgical techniques to ensure that you know what you're doing and do not learn from videos or, or, or from YouTube. Definitely, it's, it's, it's very important and we have to work more to impress on people regarding neurotrauma care in theater. But also very important is the pre-hospital care because if your patient does not arrive in time, 
no matter what you do, really is going to be not going to be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Peter Hutchinson, would you like to what would you like to say about this? No, I, I think that this is all good. Anything that promotes the improvement in neurotrauma care in any country it is really good, including advances in surgery, advances in pre-hospital care investigation. But I think we just need to be cautious that we address, you know, if you look at the planet, there's seven billion people, there's five billion people who don't have access to any sort of decent surgical care so we need to refine it at the top end but we've got to try and get access of better pre-hospital care investigations and ct scanners to those that that, that that need it correct um we have a question from one of the panelists dr emika he please go ahead hi uh, good day everybody good day. can you hear me yeah we can hear you please introduce yourself oh, great yeah, my name is Emeka Mwaribe. I'm a neurosurgeon in Nigeria and also a trauma and critical care fellow here in Nigeria. Um, I must really uh, commend uh, Professor Peter Hutchison for all you're doing in neurotrauma generally and your group at the NIHR. Now, we have a very unique problem in a part of the world, like most of the lower middle income countries, and that is we have a, an enormous number of uh, neurotrauma patients who come every day in fact last night i'm on call still on call at the hospital last night a young man you know who had suffered a traumatic severe tbi in another hospital uh, which is about 30 minutes to my center of course um before he could get to the hospital here he had died on the road because one we have a poor or non-existent pre-hospital setup sure. and that's a huge problem very 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 huge problem most of the patients uh, come in here at the back uh, of a motorcycle accompanied by other people, or they come in slopped, you know, uh, bunched up in the back of a taxi mm -hmm. or in the back of the police van. Mm -hmm. There's non-existent pre-hospital care. And most of the time, at the time the patient come in, hypoxia and hypovolemia have killed those patients. Mm -hmm. The one of yesterday died on arrival. You know, are they, are they, are they out? Uh, we had gotten ready, they called us, we were ready for the patient, but it's time the patient got, came to us. So that's a huge problem for us. We are trying as much as possible to, to you know, reach out to our governments to try to get something done at a pre-hospital setting. That is one. Again, we have very few neurosurgeons in the environment, and that's still the big problem for us. Now, um, Currently, uh, the, our, uh, the society, Nigerian Academy of Neurological Societies in Nigeria, we've uh, we developed a neurotrauma subgroup, subcommittee, of which I'm the secretary of the subcommittee. Currently, we are also developing guidelines tailored to our peculiarities in our environment to help us you know, in the practice of neurosurgery. Because like most people will say, we don't have all the fancy equipment. ICP monitoring is non-existent in our environment. Very few. Once in a while, people will do ICP, and it's very expensive because people uh, uh, people pay out of pockets, you know. So it's very non-existent. And that's why I love the idea of the non-invasive uh, ICP monitoring, uh, you know, uh, which you have someone from Malawi mentioned, my friend from Malawi, and you, you promised to, you know, send some help. We also, uh, the genos part of it, yes, I'm going to also say, um, champion the course of genos. We spread it, we discuss this in our subcommittee and encourage as many centers as possible to key into it because it's going to be of help to us. Most people don't know the enormity. Yes, we know that there is a lot of neurotrauma in the low and middle income countries. Well, people don't have the figures. The figures out there do not represent the actual figures we have. They do not represent at all. I look at our trauma, the little registry we've tried to keep here in our trauma center. In the past four years, in our registry alone, in the trauma center, we see patients that come within the first 72 hours. We have over 5,000, um, over 3,000 neurotrauma patients in over four, in four years. That is over a thousand a year in just one center. And that is enormous. These are the people who su succeed in even coming to the hospital. I'm not talking about those who died at the mm -hmm. site of accidents or those 
go and manage in other you know little areas around us. So that is huge. So I believe that the genome study will help us a lot, those of us in the low and middle income countries, to to give the true figure of the problem we have. I know the figures play a lot of role in assistance given to to uh, the, you know the various centers. So another area I need we I need help is the we we'll try also try to develop our own local registry. Yes, I saw the registry that is out of the genomes. It would be nice for us to adapt that, you know, so that subsequently in subsequent studies, will, it will be easier to uh, to project um, data, you know, to a global uh, uh, collection. So thank you very much, group uh, Professor Hutchison and uh, Professor Savide, you know, and it was here in Nigeria the last time we had a hands congress, and it was quite very helpful to us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those comments, and for really emphasising that it's the it's the hypoxia and hypotension that we need to address uh, in parallel with with um, you know advances in in further management in the emergency department uh, and and in neurosurgery. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, John, for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about neurotrauma care in the LMIC's perspective, and I'm going to try and uh, explain uh, uh, what you already know, I suppose, the difference between the developed countries and the lower and middle income countries, really. Um, this is my hospital. Uh, we know that 74% of surgeries for traumatic brain injuries are needed in lower and middle income countries. These are the number of surgeries needed, not the number of surgeries done. Um, so there's a big gap uh, of, of surgeries required in the lower and middle income countries. And that goes, again, also for traumatic spine injuries. Uh, more than 89% of the traumatic spine injuries uh, occur and the surgeries are required are in the lower and middle income countries. So there's a huge number. And we know that there's a big gap of the number of new surgeries required in the world, and most of them are from the lower and middle income countries. And I think the numbers are more than 20,000 neurosurgeons required, really. And this is the reason because of the, uh, the, 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 the bad traffic. Um, as you know, accidents, people are not following traffic rules. Uh, they're not caring about themselves. Although the rules are there everywhere for everybody to follow, but people do not follow them. Uh, and this is a slide which everybody is seeing all the time. Um, uh, everywhere, uh, I think it's a competition to see uh, the numbers increasing on the motorbike, really. Um, we did uh, some, in our neurotrauma registry, we looked at the uh, patients coming to us with head trauma, and we saw that in the majority of the patients on motorbike accidents, they had no helmets. The 30% unknown, I am sure, would also be the ones with are not wearing helmets. Also, then if you look at the, uh, the seat belt, um, then again, majority of the patients coming in with road traffic engines were not wearing seat belts uh, in our setup. And of course, then uh, the terrorist incidents happening all over the world in different areas, uh, recently in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, also. So we know that if we strengthen the trauma systems, including the pre hospital care and transport and initial care in the emergency departments, um, it will make a very big difference uh, to the number of patients who are uh, uh, who are saved really, um, and who would do better uh, later on. So, when we look at what is required, and when we look at what is different between us and the developed countries, most important is pre-hospital care, then the ER care, intensive care, rehabilitation. And then the most important things are the neurotrauma registry, neurotrauma guidelines, as was just suggested by our friend from Nigeria. And the foremost important thing is the prevention of neurotrauma. Uh, when we look at uh, this uh, small study, which we did in four countries from, uh, from Pakistan, uh, from India, uh, and, and from Surabaya and in Indonesia and Pakistan, we found that uh, uh, Majority of the patients uh, really who uh, had an accident, they were provided emergency treatment by the local 
bystanders and not by the ambulance service. Uh, there are very few ambulance services, they're not available. And if there are any ambulance available, they do not have any trained paramedics or oxygen or suction or any facilities in the ambulance. And if you look at this slide, uh, when we looked at in these countries, a majority uh, came into the hospital unaccompanied by a nurse or doctor or a paramedic. So very important to develop pre-hospital care. And I, I think in most of the lower and middle income countries, this would be the foremost thing, what we would be doing to develop ambulances, train personnel, so that the patients can be treated at the site of accident and then can be transferred safely to the hospital where they are required to go. And when they arrive into the hospital, that they have proper trauma beds and trauma care. Intensive care management um, doesn't have to be ICP monitoring. Uh, of course, it is, it, is, it is something which needs to be done, but it is not something that if you don't have ICP monitoring at the end of the world. No, uh, you can treat, you can manage head injuries in intensive care. Uh, protecting the airway is very important. And one way of protecting the airway, if you cannot intubate and ventilate, is doing a tracheostomy. Uh, that makes a very big difference by helping uh, the patients improve their oxygenation and giving oxygen on time. Really. Of course, if you ventilate the patient, do ICP monitoring, do all the parameters, it's going to make even better difference. After doing all that, <clears throat> rehabilitation is something uh, which uh, is not available in most of the lower and middle income countries. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at studies, uh, where patients were treated um, uh, for craniotomies, decompressive craniotomies in low and middle income countries and in developed countries like a study from India and United States, the initial outcome score was the same, but six months outcome score was a big difference because uh, the patients in the United States were getting rehabilitation, where in India they were not getting rehabilitation and the mortality rate suddenly increased tremendously. So it's very important. And when we look at this study, again, from uh, these four countries, we found that majority of the patients are being discharged uh, to their families. And one way of uh, uh, looking at it, what we found was to train the family members in giving uh, physiotherapy, uh, tracheostomy care, uh, and limb care, uh, and DVT care, catheter care, and nasogastric tube feeding, et cetera to the family members, and that we have found is helpful. And if it is done uh, in a proper fashion, uh, in a structured fashion. Data systems uh, are not available. Uh, we know some people use police data or some combined databases. Uh, the reason that we say that the 90% of trauma occurs in LMICs, but 90% of papers and trauma come out of developed countries is because there is no uh, trauma registry. Uh, and I think this global neurotrauma outcome study is a very big step towards inculcating into our minds that we must have a trauma registry, neurotrauma registry, and also teaching us how to make a neurotrauma registry. And I think moving forwards and developing a, a international neurotrauma industry would be very good. We in our hospital have our own uh, neurotrauma industry. This is a web-based uh, online registry, and it can you can you can you know have so many parameters. As it shows us here, that the time from injury to presentation is greater than 24 hours in majority of the patients. And so we know that first of all that the neurosurgeons are not available in remote areas. All the neurosurgeons are concentrated in the urban population. The roads are very bad, and the free hospital care is not good, and most of the people are being transported in their own vehicles there. And of course, this is the TBI diagnosis of different patterns. And you can see that the type of severe injuries and moderate injuries. So I think it's very important to develop a neurotrauma registry. Guidelines were mentioned. I think setting the minimal standards of care uh, from the excellent site
to the hospital and to rehab are very important. Uh, if we say that, you know, we do not have high tech facilities available and so we cannot have proper guidelines, no. I think it's important to develop guidelines and that is why the Neurotrauma Committee has tasked a group to develop multi-layered uh, uh, guidelines so that starting from lower level but to reaching to the, the gold standard of guidelines. Every country and neurosurgeons must strive to develop guidelines for the peripheral hospitals, the referring hospitals, and for their own neurosurgeons for uh, pre-hospital care, ER care, and in ICU and in theater. So it's, I think, something very important. Uh, this is a, a, a thing written in Urdu. This is uh, it's something which is given to the patient's relatives when the patient is going home to ensure that if there is any problem for the patient, they're all written down. Uh, it's a, these are some guidelines for the patient's relatives that if the patient is vomiting or has got a headache or has fits, that they must bring them back to the hospital. I think uh, this is something which can be done by everybody, just a piece of paper given to the patient's relatives. But the most important thing is prevention. Uh, I think we know very well that most of the injuries, head injuries can be prevented. And we teach uh, people here by doing uh, regular walks uh, in, in, uh, in our neurosurgical society meetings uh, by having uh, conferences and using students to develop posters. Um, and in one of our uh, colleges, a uh, non-medical college, home economics college, uh, they have it in the curriculum to go and teach students in schools, school children, about the prevention of neurotrauma. And I think, again, something which uh, the lower and middle income country neurosurgeons must look at and spend time on. Um, and you must uh, get in touch maybe with Think First International, which is the International Injury Prevention Foundation, uh, which uh, works a lot on, on prevention. And the Neurotrauma Committee of the WFNS has partnered with Think First International uh, uh, on this thing to do uh, prevention of head injuries. <clears throat> and this is something which I must show you, uh, this collaboration with WHO and many organizations on the Vietnam's mandatory motorcycle helmet law. Uh, you would be amazed at the number of people who survived, uh, uh, who, who survived uh, the following day uh, when the helmets were made mandatory. And the helmets were made cheap and they, had, they were porous so that the concept of this thing of having um, uh, uh, in, in the heat you cannot wear helmets, that was taken away as well. Uh, so out of the box thinking, and I think if you go to Hanoi now, we'll find that everybody is wearing helmets there. Uh, we have been working with Key Park, the Harvard Group uh, School of um, Public Health on developing comprehensive recommendations for management of brain and spine injuries. Uh, and, and this, these are for, for uh, the, the public, for the government uh, sector. And we are going to present them on 15th November uh, 2019 in Peshawar, along with the ICRAN, which unfortunately we had to postpone from March. Uh, and we would love for all, for all of you to come here. And the idea is that 80% of the world has access to essential neurocycle care by 2030, and 80% of the world is within four hours of neurocycle center by 2030. And very important that 90% of LMICs with national neurotrauma plans in place by 2021. We have piggybacked it on the national vision for surgical care uh, uh, in Pakistan, which is uh, uh, going to be the vision for 2025. And this is the, uh, on, the, on the national surgical obstetric and aesthetic plan, which the WHO has proposed. So all of you must look at this, the lower and middle income countries. And the plan is that uh, we should develop the Peshawar recommendations in November and go forward. And in 2021, uh, we should have done more when we go to Colombia. And this is the timeline. Another thing which we are working on is mass casualty centers uh, to in integrate uh, for natural and unnatural disasters and uh, between collaboration between developed and developing countries. 
for health delivery, for medical education, for medical research and poverty reduction. Uh, our center, Northway General Hospital, now is a WFNS collaborative center for neurotrauma for three months. And anybody interested, uh, they can uh, come here for three months for neurotrauma training. Uh, and we provide uh, free stay accommodation and food here. And I would like to welcome you all again, once again, to the ICRAN uh, on, from the 14th to 17th November. Uh, and we still have some scholarships which we can give to young neurosurgeons uh, coming from lower and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Atar Khan. Okay. Thank you. So do we have any comments, questions from the panel? Yes, Anyone? Yes. yes. Good morning, Professor Tariq. Uh, I'm so glad to meet you again uh, on the panel. I remember, I hope it is in uh, August or September when you maybe done here a webinar about hysternostomy. And uh, you show me well uh, how to dissect uh, gently, gently <laughs> carotid around uh, optic nerves. Uh, I'm so glad to meet you again, and uh, thank you for your uh, brilliant uh, presentation. It is so clear. And uh, now the problem uh, we have, it is about severe injury of brain. And uh, I am on one work, uh, prospecting one work uh, in my department about uh, uh, traumatic brain injury severe, and uh, we done um, uh, we, we don't have uh, ICP monitoring, but we done Doppler transcranial uh, to to have correlation about clinical and uh, imaging CT scan before uh, before uh, um, uh, uh, before uh, take decision about management. And uh, I, now I am really convinced that craniectomy only <coughs> craniectomy decompressive not just uh, sufficient. We have to go both uh, about craniectomy decompressive and uh, cisternostomy. And uh, I read one paper of you, I think you, uh, when you done your last presentation uh, webinar, and uh, we have to move uh, together about uh, this recommendation and uh, it will be benef a great benefit about our passion. And uh, I have to, I want to thank you very much and uh, say welcome to all guys who come in this panel today. Thank you, Professor Tariq. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I look forward to you joining us in November in Peshawar and giving a presentation on, on, on your experiences on neurotrauma um, and, and management. Thank you, uh, Hira and John, for the invitation, um, and thanks very much to Professor Khan um, and uh, Dr. Cherry and, uh, and everyone else, and uh, Dr. Aseni and everyone else on the call who supported the GENOS study. We're very grateful, um, and to Professor Hutchinson, uh, but I have to say that because he's my boss. Um, so I'm just going to, I mean, a lot of this has been covered already, but I'll just give a quick update on the Global Neurotrauma um, Outcome Study. So some of these figures have been presented already, but to me, the best study so far about the global burden of TBI worldwide is the Global Burden of Disease Study, their analysis from 2016, which was published either this year or last year, and they estimate about 27 million cases of TBI happen per year, all TBI, uh, severe, moderate, and mild. Um, and about 10% of uh, all deaths worldwide, um, this is from the GVD study as well, are due to injuries. So as Professor Hutchinson said, about five or six million deaths uh, per year. And most deaths due to trauma um, are due to, well, either massive hemorrhage from uh, thoracoabdominal, pelvic, or, or long bone wound, um, or due to TBI. A lot of them really are due to TBI. So it's a very large uh, burden in terms of uh, mortality and indeed morbidity. Um, and we don't know exactly how many uh, traumatic brain injuries require surgery because we don't really have data from low middle income countries yet, but about 4% uh, 
um, of those admitted in the US, this is from the US National Trauma Data Bank, will require surgery. Um, so it's quite a large burden. And obviously, um, that figure applies to the whole spectrum of TBI, including mild TBI. Um, and so in severe and moderate TBI, it's a much higher proportion that requires surgery. So, I mean, in the, the GENOS study is really focusing, um, initially at least, on the surgical management of TBI, and it's long been known, you know, there's many classic papers from um, the 80s and beyond, that timely and appropriate surgical intervention for TBI um, is associated with a much more favorable outcome. And if you present more than four hours um, after the trauma or more than two hours after um, slipping into a coma, then your outcome is much worse following a, a trauma craniotomy for a acute subdural, like extradural, for example. Um, and as we've already said, now uh, multiple global surgery and global health organizations are starting to recognize that. And there's emerging evidence that actually um, it, from groups like Harvard that, um, that it's economically efficient to provide this service as well. Um, so I think this slide has already been put up, but um, you know, in, in essence, the um, uh, GENOS study um, is a multi-center international prospective cohort study. Um, teams pick any 30-day period between the 1st of October last year and the 1st of October this year, so there's still plenty of time to participate um, and just collect data on all patients receiving emergency surgery for TBI um, during that time period and follow them up for 14 days. So for most sites, it's not a particularly onerous study to um, participate in. And teams consist, consist of uh, neurosurgeons, but also um, anaesthetists, intensivists, who have supported our study an awful lot, as well as residents and um, medical students, many of whom have been uh, instrumental in setting up the study at their uh, institution. The study consists of two parts, really. So this is um, the, I just put up the, the data fields from the patient data set. Um, I will just say, in addition to the patient data set, we also do ask sites to uh, fill out a site questionnaire about the resources they have for the management of acute brain injury. And that includes things like, do you regularly have access to a mechanical ventilator for your severe TBIs? Uh, do you have ICP monitoring? Um, do you have adequate pre-hospital care? Things like that. Uh, and that is, so far, of the sites that participated, produced quite an interesting um, set of results um, that haven't really been reported before. And just to highlight a few things um, on this, in addition to basic sort of demographic um, and epidemiological data, um, we've got quite a few fields here which pertain to pre-hospital care, which has already been highlighted um, as very important and personally I think is probably the great limiting step in terms of improving outcome from severe TBI um, or moderate and severe TBI. Um, so to direct your attention, there's a couple fields on whether or not there is a pre-surgery episode of hypotension or hypoxia, which is obviously very important. Um, and also the time to hospital, um, which is uh, going to be one of the main determinants, as, we, uh, as I've already said. Um, there's a, no, a, num a number of fields on operative data, and then the outcomes are fairly basic. It's um, survival to discharge or 14 days post-surgery, similar to that used in the CRASH study, which is the biggest study um, done on TBI so far, including low and middle income countries um, and a number of other variables, including surgical site infection, ICU stay, um, but no long term outcome. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So, oops. Uh, so all uh, this slide is just to highlight that um, all team members, so teams are two to four people at each institution and all team members will be recognized as uh, PubMed citable collaborators on all publications resulting from the study um, in the sort of to, to demonstrate this is a collaborative study more than anything else. And then this is just a, a, a quick, um, uh, oops, sorry. This is just a quick, oh, my mistake, sorry. Uh, update on where we are so far. So 108 sites uh, have uh, signed up, 50 countries, nine of which are in sub-Saharan Africa, um, 21 sites in total. Um, and it's quite a diverse range of sites we have. So about um, five come from what can be defined as conflict or post-conflict zones. Um, so, so far, Iraq, Syria, uh, and Libya. Um, and I highlight this because the data so far suggests that actually the, the countries in the world with the highest incidence of traumatic brain injury and traumatic spinal cord injury, perhaps not surprisingly, are countries that uh, currently have active conflicts. And this is from the Global Burden of Disease study as well. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, quite a good split of um, 
of, of sites from both high, what, well, what are considered by the um, UN high human development index countries and low, uh, medium or low uh, human development index uh, countries, you know, which roughly maps to high versus low middle income countries or, or other ways of stratifying countries based on their uh, development. And what's quite nice about this is, as has already been highlighted, actually, um, it, it, there aren't many neurosurgeons in um, uh, low and middle income countries. So to have a good representation, a good sample from both low and medium HDI index countries is, um, is, it, it, it is something we're, we're quite glad about. Um, and this is just a map demonstrating um, roughly where, where, where sites are coming from. This is not quite up to date, but it does give you an idea of, of the, the spread of sites. So I said 108 sites or, or teams certainly have um, participated in data collection so far. About 56% have completed their uh, study period um, and about 700 patients have been entered into the, the database so far. So, uh, and we're just about halfway through now. So we're quite hopeful we'll have quite a good sample size. And the point of this presentation isn't to uh, present data from the study because it's ongoing, but just because this is a specifically neurosurgical presentation. Um, I have put this slide up um, to just show the numbers of procedures, um, uh, of the numbers of each type of procedure um, that have been uh, entered for interest more than anything else. Um, the most common is evacuation of a supratentorial uh, extradural hematoma followed by an acute subdural um, hematoma. Um, I would direct your attention just because one of the next talks is Dr. Cherian um, presenting that we do have about 20 cases of uh, cystinostomy um, from different uh, sites. And that's a very, um, could be a quite interesting aspect of the, the study what we're excited about. Um, in addition, there's also um, quite a few cases of what have been defined as exploratory burr holes, um, as in operating without a CT. Um, some of these are not truly exploratory burr holes, some have been uh, sort of burr holes for chronic subdural hematoma, for example, that have been incorrectly entered, but there are a few that um, genuinely are exploratory burr holes, and certainly um, my experience of working in Zambia, which is where I'm based at the moment, is that uh, the vast majority of general surgical centres, uh, in this country at least, working at sort of second level provincial hospitals, uh, do still regularly perform exploratory burr holes. Um, so it's a phenomenon that's worth studying because um, at the moment it's particularly unregulated. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. The only other thing I don't have a slide for that I want to highlight is that um, the GENOS study is a snapshot study, but um, we do want to and have plans to and are in the process of designing a uh, longitudinal hospital-based registry for all um, admitted traumatic brain injury cases called the GOTBI registry. Um, and we're hopeful that the GENOS study will then progress on to this registry. And, and in that registry, um, we will hope to do uh, things like uh, collect robust long-term uh, outcome data, both in terms of functional neuropsychological and um, and economic data. Um, but uh, there's still plenty of time to sign up for the study. Um, you can sign up at globalneurotrauma.com um, or if you have any queries, you're welcome to email um, me on uh, genos at globalneurotrauma.com um, or I can answer questions now. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the study. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the panel to be asked from Dr. Flock regarding study participation? Any questions? Anyone having any troubles in signing up or something? Um, well, I just have uh, one comment. Yes, please. Yeah, well, there, yeah thank, thank you for the update. Uh, I noticed you said there are 21 sites from Sub Saharan Africa uh, from nine countries, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So please, I, I will, uh, well, I'm the chair of the Young Neurosurgeon uh, Committee of the Young of the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. So we've been encouraging the young neurosurgeons to participate in uh, this uh, in the genus study. As you know, trauma is mostly done by the young neurosurgeons and the residents in most of the countries. So uh, I would appreciate if you could send to me the, the details, the countries that have already participated, that can maybe try to follow up with the countries that have not yet uh, uh, maybe joined the study. Yeah, th thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that as soon as the webinar is finished. But thank you. Yeah, you can, yes, you can contact uh, Angelus. Uh, he can forward it to me. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll email and see both you and, but that would be wonderful because we're very 
keen of all regions to, to Sub-Saharan Africa is one that we'd really like to, to have participate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, okay, so well, that's all. For I have a question. Yes, one yes, question, yes, John. Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How many countries do you have participating? How many how many parties are participating now? There is uh, 108 sites um, or 108 teams. Um, some hospitals have sort of uh, two teams participating, so probably about kind of 100 um, teams, and it's from 50 different countries. Okay, so you're happy with the response? Um, we're quite happy, yes, but uh, okay. there's uh, always room for um, for, more. For, for more. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Dr. Clark, I have one small question if you're still there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The thing is that when we are uh, trying to get to participate, like I personally did that in Nepal with Professor Chirion Center, I was there, and there are a lot of troubles going through the um, you know, enrolling your center and then going to the ethics committee because that is a big problem for most countries, especially in regions like Pakistan and in India, perhaps. In Nepal, we had some troubles going through that because it says that this is an audit and this is not a, um, a study which requires official uh, approval. So, if you could just yeah. highlight on this fact a little bit and then we can start with Professor Chiring, he's now here. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fair point. I mean, I because I'm based in Zambia at the moment, I, I organize the ethics for Cambridge, but also for Zambia. Yeah. And it's much more difficult to get the study of foods in Zambia than it is yes. uh, in Cambridge. So I, I, I do sympathize. I mean, I, I guess the, the barriers are, as you say, mostly this study in many jurisdictions will be considered uh, research. So you'll need to go through the full ethical application. And we've not really got a way around mm. that. Um, the other thing is that some sites have reported is that there is a, a cost applying to uh, eth ethics and, and in particular to for an international collaborative study. So I think for studies in the future, certainly that was a problem that we faced in, in like I personally faced that in Nepal when we were trying to seek approval for the genus. So it, like we had to go through a whole lot of process and go through a local body and then the national body. So it was yeah. and despite the fact that it was said that this has been regarded as an audit rather than an original study. So, so this is a problem which is going on and most in these countries where we already have problems with collection of data, then we have to go through added hurdles of uh, having uh, ethics review and all these things. So is there any way we can just... I think the simple answer is um, unfortunately no. I mean, we still no. haven't, the, um, one of our main problems at the moment is we still haven't got approval from the uh, Indian um, National Ethics Committee, the HMSC. Yes. Um, and that's been a big problem because you know over a billion people and many of our sites from there want to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the only thing that can be said is that um, if we run a study like this, uh, an iteration of a study like this in the future, um, at least we're aware of the sort of ethical barriers um, and can kind of account for that proactively. But um, but no, it has been definitely even from our end, it's been quite a, a struggle in some yeah. jurisdictions. Um, from Tariq, uh, David, uh, Hutch, uh, everybody. See, my only point is uh, that I've always been telling, I don't have anything against uh, uh, decompressive, but over the last hundred years, we haven't changed. It's changing now. I can see that Dinos has put us, it's a great honor that uh, Dinos has listed us as one of the treatment options. It is uh, changing, and I completely am uh, obliged to thank all Peter Hutchison, Professor Peter Hutchison, David Clark, and uh, Ezin, and all the other uh, people involved in Dinos that I'm, we are uh, obliged that it's been put as uh, one of the options in Dinos. So, you know, over the last 10 years that I've been doing this, I've been showing some videos which are very hunky dory. And Tariq was probably referring to those uh, videos when uh, when he said that you saw these on the you see these videos on the YouTube and then you realize that it is not the same when you open a tight brain. So what I thought is uh, I will show you some really mean videos. 
these are my dark secrets okay so these are videos where uh, which can get most of the surgeons to pee in their pants okay but we're going to show you that and before that i will just uh, tell you as to what is the anatomical basis of cystinostomy and uh, well, the physiology is well published right now. It's uh, a lot of people know about chase of shift edema. I'm not going to talk on that. So I'll probably take about 10 minutes to show you uh, a little bit about the anatomy. And uh, I, I will show you some of the really bad surgeries. Okay? Don't share it because don't go and tell people that this is how cystinostomy looks like. We've got very elegant videos. But what I'm going to show you is when you are a resident, and you've got a very bad brain. How do you take a leap of faith? How do you take a leap of faith underneath that frontal lobe? Get into that cisterns, open the cisterns, get your CSF out, and how the brain's going to look after that. So let's start. I mean, I'm going to share. Uh, how do I share? Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, can you see? Yes. Can you see? Yeah, I can see your next time. Right. So, well, I'm not going into all this. Let's start off with uh, my usual video. So, it's a little frontotemporal flap removal. So that is a frontal lobe, that is a temporal lobe. The whole point of cystinostomy is taking out. I don't know why it's gone into that uh, funny green color. Yeah. So the whole point of cystinostomy is taking out this bone as much as possible. Take out the bone. This is called the sagittal unlocking. And this helps you to get into the frontal base. So the moment you get into the frontal base, things become easy. As long as this bone is there, you're going to have to retract brain. If you're going to have to retract brain, you're not going to be doing very well. So bone removal, this is a skull-based principle. Remove it as much as possible. You don't have to remove it as I'm doing it right now. You don't have to uh, go to the entire Kawase triangle and the dollings, complete dollings approach with the clinoidics. All that you don't have to do. But this is the basis. This is the very basis of this cystinostomy approach. So this is called the unlocking. So let us see some more cases now. So this is a live case where that is a, that is a frontal lobe. My arrow is on the frontal lobe. That is a clinoid. This is a case of trauma. That's a clinoid. So why am I removing the clinoid? Because once I remove the clinoid, I'm right into the systems. So I am dissecting over the cavernous sinus so that I get some axial unlocking also. Please, uh, if you are not familiar with this concept, we have a lot of videos on YouTube with how simple, how simple concepts like axial. See, see now this is a frontal lobe, this is a temporal lobe, and you know how now extra durally how close i am to the base i'm so close to the base that when i open i'm right into the suprasilar system that's the whole point of this surgery so that is cavernous sinus the arrow what you see right now is the cavernous sinus superior orbital fissure and the cavernous sinus so if there is a small breach you can see the kind of bleeding that's happening so this is one of the oldest videos this is 2015 i mean so transcavernous surgery done four years back. I mean, not very elegant, I agree. But uh, uh, definitely, we are, this is an acute subdural and we are opening up everything so that we can get into the base right away. Now, you can see the cavernous sinus bleeding. Because there is a small breach, you put a surgical cell, that'll be okay. Put a small cell, there is nothing to worry about there. Put a surgical cell, wait for some time, it'll be okay. Okay, but more than this, this, uh, this kind of mobilization is enough. Now, you see, you open the dura in this region, 
you take out the clinoid and you open the dura in this region, you are right into the systems. So this is what I want the young neurosurgeons to figure, that you can talk about a lot of things, but at the, at the end of the day, we are neurosurgeons. We need to look at what advances is possible. I mean, of course, we cannot uh, buy fancy monitorings and all that in here, but, and of course, we cannot wait like in the West, uh, ICU monitoring, it's not possible here. So the time that we can wait, if we have the correct indicators, that's probably something that uh, I hope uh, Angelo Scolias and Professor Hutchison and uh, the rest of the guys will help me to, you know, probably help me to find out uh, the indicators. We have indicate indicators for cystinostomy early surgery, but this is one thing I have to be very interested. So to prob also probably help our pre-trauma and pro-trauma, pro, pro, I mean, post-surgical uh, ICU management. This is something, you know, we have to take the best step forward together. There's no point uh, uh, advocating one approach or the other. So in, in our cases, we have to go for an early surgery, use a microscope, and after that, open the systems, drain the CSF, and after that, we are... After, once we drain the CSF, we're going to put in a uh, we're going to put in a drain, and after the drain, we are going to drain for five days. So the results uh, are much better. So now we are doing an extraduodal clinoidectomy. This is a trauma, not always needed needed to be done. Most of the time, just phenoid-rich drilling is enough. But sometimes drain is really tight, and then you want some additional space. Clinodectomy is going to help. Again, as Tariq said, first you have to you have to train in this. So let us, this is all elegant surgery, but let us see some of the dural openings. All right. Get ready, brace yourself. It's a very, very tight brain. So we're going to have a dural opening right now. This is again four years old video. A lot of tell, people tell me that, oh, don't, no, we don't see really tight uh, dural opening. This is as tight as it gets. You will see this. I'll show you a few more. And I'll show you how we get into the systems. And what happens? This dural opening is in the right in the base. It is not a C-shaped opening. It's a right in the base. And you see what happens. That's frontal lobe coming out. Just follow the orbital roof. Just follow the orbital roof. And it will take you to the optic now. So you see the retraction that you may have to do. But this is, you remember, if anybody knows about white matter, this is anterior to the speech area. It is a not extremely elegant cortex, of course. I believe that every single neuron is elegant. But to save lives at this scenario, you will see the brain. When I open the, open the uh, dura further, you will see the brain. You're getting, if you know where your anatomy is, you're getting into the cistern now. Once you get into the cistern, let out that CSF, irrigate. This is something that is very difficult for a lot of neurosurgeons. I mean, we do vascular. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys would have seen a lot of our vascular and skull-based videos. We never retract like this. We never handle the brain like this in uh, vascular. But trauma is a completely different story. Please remember that. And the results, if you do this to start with, and after that, you go ahead with all the... You can see elegant videos of uh, cystinostomy also. Once we have done this phase, this is the phase which was missing in my videos because this is the first part where there's a tight brain. See, now you can see the optic nerve. Clearly see the optic nerve now. Can you see that, everybody? That's the optic nerve. That's a yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's the optic nerve and that's the carotid. And uh, yes. you can see the optic, optic carotid window there. Okay? 
Do you remember how tight the brain was to start with? But once you see this, you see how much brain came out in the beginning. You put in, I am not using anything but a suction. I am, you, I am opening the, you should know where the perforators are. My suction is almost at zero. You should never suck all the perforators. You should use the suction. At this point, you should suck, use your suction. Just like, and you can see the basilar artery now. You can, uh, you can, you are seeing the basilar artery. And now it is four minutes. And uh, in the optical carotid window, you can see the basilar. And you just put in a drain and you just wash out the blood. So you just put in a, you put in, never bipolar. There is no need to bipolar. There will be a lot of bleeding. So you don't. You just need to irrigate and stop. One of the things is the moment the ICP goes. See the see the brain pulsating now. You remember the brain how it was when it started. See the pulsation now. So you keep on irrigating, and this brain is much better. The results are much better. Instead of allowing half the brain to herniate out into a defect that you have created. 12 or 13 centimeter decompressive hemicranectomy, which can be done by anybody. So, again, you go into that. Okay, the brain is pulsating. You have some space now. You, you're seeing the optic, you know, you're seeing the, you're seeing the uh, carotid. So, go into this. This is as bad as it gets. This is what you are going to expect when you are doing it for the first time. So, as I told you, this was the, this was the part which was missing in my videos because it's not elegant. Nobody, I mean, I started the technique. I would not be proud of this part. Okay, but this is how it starts. And I'm sure Parthiban, Wang, Roy, everybody who's a uh, master's of doing systemostomy, now I'm bringing in my microsuction. Okay, I'm, I'm going into where the basilar is. I'm using zoom. Okay, you can see the temporal lobe is uh, over the third nerve, herniated over the third nerve. You can always see that temporal lobe over the third nerve in this kind of severe injuries. So you are going into where the basilar is, okay? So you see the brain damage here, and you see how much CSF after some time, how much CSF starts coming out. You see the brain damage you, under the patties. You can see how much the brain is damaged, and you can see. That's a basilar artery coming up. Then once the basilar, you can see the basilar artery now. That is a basilar artery. Okay, it's coming up there. We all the retinas. Yeah, I like the music uh, in the background. It's good. So uh, you can see now you're putting in a you're putting in a drain. Number eight feeding tube. Okay, number eight feeding tube. You put in and see the brain. You see the extensive damage there. We are not doing. Uh, uh, any contusion ectomies, we are not doing anything. Whatever conditions comes out with the retraction, comes out. You see the yeah, brain, no. how lax? See how lax, how lax it is. Hello? Okay. Another opening, another dural opening. Okay, diffuse brain swelling. Okay, here again, I am using the microscope in the initial phase just as a light source, nothing else. Because it is so hectic, I know the brain is going to just leak out. It is, this is not even a subdural. If I have a subdural, it's much better because once I really take, take the subdural out, the brain is lax for at least some time. But this is pure diffuse brain swelling. Okay, severe, bad brain swelling. See, and after we do all that, what we did, okay, after all that, see. Now that this brain is pulsatile, lax, pulsatile, and it's a, 2.5 to 3 centimeter opening. You just irrigate, put surgical, cell, and it's nicely pulsatile, lax, very lax. Obviously, the results are going to be better. Okay, there is no no doubt about it that the results are going to be better. So let us show you some cases. One of the first cases where we had done a decompressive and a cystinostomy, but the difference here you can see. You can see the difference, the first scan versus the second scan. The difference is that 
the systems are open here no systems 4 by 15 both people is dilated but here the post op scan you will see there will be systems brain is not really bulging out or anything okay we could have put the bone flap back and this is the guy in the icu okay this is the guy in another another case okay very bad brain swelling no systems at all you can see this is after this is after cystinostomy another case after cystinostomy another child severe damage after cystinostomy is the cystinal catheter there that's a discharge that's a discharge and that's how this child is another case very very bad brain swelling you can see how how bad this brain swelling is so you can see this is a retraction injury this part is retraction injury and that is a catheter sitting there so bone is kept back and you see her at the seven post operative day she still has a third nerve palsy this kind of well this is one of our uh, very severe cystinostomy patients this is from china where uh, these guys they have their icp also monitoring icp monitoring also these are cases from china their series they have a lot of uh, surgeons in china doing it right now in the wfns beijing we have a uh we'll have a session on this and uh no this is not necessary this slide is not necessary yeah so uh i mean we have been going to various places and we've been trying to uh you know popularize it new techniques so it's very very difficult to get any recognition a lot of people don't even uh, they they don't even uh, uh acknowledge it but uh, i'm very glad and i'm uh, very happy that uh, uh, professor peter hutchison david clark and all these people um, angelos everybody has been really helpful franco has been also very helpful tarik everybody has been supportive so i'm very glad and i'm i'm, I'm sure that uh, you know it will be a new era where uh, the young neurosurgeons will introduce microsurgery into trauma and that will change a lot of things so really proud of uh, yeah this is the part where cystinostomy has been mentioned in genomes mm -hmm. so very proud and uh, very glad and i hope it uh, it is a harbinger of change let us see thank you very much thank you so much so do we have any questions or comments from the panel yes professor tarik would you like to yes um yes professor okay. just just give me a moment ah, okay. to, to know yeah yes, professor yes. tarik yes please yeah uh, thank you very much i um, excellent um, very glad you showed the difficult um, parts as well um, i have never been against sister nostomy uh, or you know i don't want to compare or compete between decompressive craniectomies or sister nostomies Uh, I feel maybe there's a place for everything, whatever helps the patient. That is the most important thing. All my time, what I've been trying to say is that which you mentioned. Thank you very much. That the microsurgical techniques are the first and foremost thing which our young neurosurgeons should learn before they jump into doing this very difficult and later on looking very elegant um, uh, surgery. um and and a very impressive what you showed uh, coming down and and looking down into the bezel and everything uh, and an excellent way to do everything um again as i said any avenue every avenue 
should be looked at and should be explored to try and save, because most of them are young patients. They are, they're, they're young people. Uh, to try and save them in, in any way which is possible, uh, whether it is just ICP monitoring, ventilation, it is decompressive craniectomy, it is cisternostomy, any, anything which is going to be exploratory buttholes. When I came back to Pakistan in 1990, we had no CT scan. We should do exploratory buttholes um, and then do a craniectomy, not a craniotomy, to try and save anybody what, doing a tracheostomy. All these things. And I think. Um, you are putting it in the right perspective, not <clears throat> not making it not making it a, a, a surgery for trainees. Uh, it is a surgery to be done by senior people, and trainees have to learn how it is done by senior people in the middle of the night at 4 a.m. or 2 a.m. Thank you, Aip. Very much. Thank you very much, Tariq. You have put it in the yeah. right. Uh, <clears throat> you know, for me. Um, I I had been a bit aggressive uh, over the years. I have been a bit aggressive pushing it, but uh, I understand that uh, everybody wants the best for the patient. It is all different perspective. Every perspective is right. It is not that somebody doing compulsory hemicranectomy has a bad intention for his patient. No, it's not right. I agree. I completely agree. So my perspective need not be right. I understand. Always my perspective need not be right. And there are sometimes what. When I get corrected by people, I understand that uh, sometimes I initially I used to think cystinostomy will help in everything. No, it doesn't. There are some indications, there are some contraindications. The initial part now it is only now that I am I I am I am comfortable showing the first uh, first parts of that surgery. It is not very non-elegant. It is uh, very difficult and it is a really terrible part. But after that, the surgery completely turns elegant. It turns into microsurgery. Aesthetic is beautiful. <coughs> I mean, as he said, everything has a place. And senior, it is not that one uh, first year resident doing decompressive hemicranic to me today can uh, tomorrow do I mean, tomorrow do cystinostomy. It's not possible. And when, when anybody tells me that, oh, uh, let us start cystinostomy, it is not easy. So you have to catch your aneurysm surgeon. You have to go take him to the theater, make sure that that fellow comes with you to the theater, open a few cisterns first time. and. And maybe first start it off with decompressive hemicranectomy. Don't start off cystinostomy as such. Start with acute subdurals. And uh, when you are doing acute subdurals, when you take out the acute subdurals, you will get some space. Then open the cisterns and see how it is. Instead of trying very bad cases in the beginning and then getting, uh, getting an impression that it can never be done. So instead of that, start with acute subdurals. Open the cisterns. See that most probably you don't need to take the bone flap off. And slowly, slowly develop it. That is what Bang, Parthiban, Roy, all of them did that. And now they have huge series and they believe in it. And I'm sure things will change slowly and it is uh, already changing. And, you know, but the whole point is we all want the best for our patient. Everybody. I mean, not, not a single neurosurgeon uh, would think something inferior for his patient, I'm sure. Because, you know, 10 years of practice teaches you that. Before that, you think the uh, uh, rest of the guys are not bothered. No, it's not so. Every single neurosurgeon is really bothered. So they, they are worried. But their perspectives, perspectives change. So, for example, Tariq's fear of that uh, a neurosurgeon, um, a young neurosurgeon starting, starting his uh, case in cystinostomy, he will do more damage than actually what is... Uh, a de a decompressive hemicranic with a de decompressive hemicranic to me, he will not do much damage, but with cystinostomy, he can really kill the patient. So, these are things to be considered. We have to balance everything together. At the end of the day, we'll have to, we'll have to train and we'll have to decide for us what is best. Thank you very much. Very true. Okay. It's actually, thank you, everybody, uh, for the talks. I, I need to, I need to go, but that, they're very nice videos. And uh, please, thank you, everybody, for supporting Genos. And uh, let's get more data and move Thank forward, helping patients from that pre-hospital emergency department, neurosurgery, the whole, the whole spectrum. So I've left my email address if anybody wants to contact me. Thanks, Tarek. Thank you, Franco. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hera, for, Thank you so much. Uh, for organising that. Thank you. Really enjoyed, the, really enjoyed it. So uh, anybody wants to, uh, then please, please email me. All right, take yes, care. I've, I've bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. I've shared your email address. Yeah, Thank you bye, so much. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks.
Okay, so question. we have one question from Dr. Yes. Kabulo for Professor Cherian. Yes, Dr. Kabulo, okay. please. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Hype, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I was reading uh, your paper in uh, Prof. Kalangu's book uh, where you were mentioning that if you have a surface hematoma, sometimes you ask the anesthetist to do a solve maneuver so you evacuate that, uh, that hematoma. Yeah. Then, uh, I mean, you, uh, you, you meant a uh, intra cerebral bleed. You can uh, evacuate like that. So, what about if there is uh, a huge subdural, acute subdural? Uh, what do you do? Are you also opening, like we do the hemicranectomy? You evacuate first the acute subdural. Maybe I missed that part. You evacuate the acute subdural hematoma, then you do the systemostomy. That was my question. Then uh, the second one, <clears throat> uh, are you also thinking of doing it now endoscopically in the future, the systemostomy? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so Kabulo, first question, uh, answer, acute subdurals are the best cases for starting systemostomy. These are really tight brains. You go into the base of the brain and you open a wide bureautomy instead of uh, opening a small basal opening, you can open a large neural opening and the subdural comes out and you have about one minute time to get into the system. So the brain, as soon as you take out the abdus, acute subdural, the brain is lax. And only after that, the brain is going to swell. In one minute, after one minute, all of us know that. You take out the subdural and you wait for five minutes, the brain will start swelling. So you have all seen that. So till that time, till the time that the brain is going to swell. You take out the acute subdural, go into the frontal base, start opening system. This is the best and the most elegant way of starting your system. Again, put a large flap. Don't ever think that you don't. I mean, there were times when we used a smaller flap. Always take a large, like a decompressive hemicranectomy flap. The brain is lax, put the flap back as a floating flap. No, no harm done. But if the brain is not lax, if you are not convinced even one person that the brain is uh, not lax, keep the bone flap out. So there is no problem. You don't have to convince anybody. It is, a, it is the patient's best that you want. So after you take out all the, uh, I mean, all the hematoma, after you evacuate everything, open all the cisterns, the brain is going to be really lax in the subdural. And after that is done, you keep the bone flap back. The only uh, exception is a sinus bleed. If there is a sinus bleed, you've got to locate it and stop the sinus bleed by putting surgical cell, packing surgical cell from where the bleed is coming from. This is very important. We have Thank a, you. Have a question. Yeah, we have a question from Dr. David Clark. Yes, please go ahead. Oh. So, so thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Charian. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think someone's asked it on the chat as well. If you are a neurosurgical resident and you want to learn how to do cystinostomy, what's the best way? Would you just recommend doing a vascular and skull-based fellowship? And then once you've done that, how, how, do, you, how do you take it forward from that? Um, that? That's my question. Come here, David. Come to us. <laughs> You will have both skull base and vascular fellowship as well as you will see a lot of cystinostomy. We have a skull base and vascular fellowship from ACNS. So okay. that is for people who have completed their neurosurgery. So we have a six month, we have a right now, uh, I mean, not Oleg who is uh, sleeping here, but uh, Krashian from Zimbabwe. I mean, we have, all, we have, uh, we have had everybody from uh, all over uh, coming for skull base. So we do the dollings and uh, lateral skull base and the endoscopic skull base, so you could you could have a fellowship here. You do a lot of vascular cases also, so you could come and uh, do this fellowship with us. And in the meanwhile, you can scrub with us for cystinosmith. We can get you a license for uh, in Nepal. So scrub in for cystinosmith with my consultants, and then you will see what is the change. Thank you. Hi, here are we. Go yes. ahead. Go ahead, Manuel. Yes, yes, Manuel. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, hello, Professor yes. Sheria. Uh, my question is about cisternotum, it's about trauma. Uh, the trauma in the cavernosus sinus. 
Roman, I, Roman Asinus. Yes, I don't find nothing about that. No classification, no nothing. I understand. See, it is something very, very rare. It is something that uh, I don't have much experience with. I have had one case where I had a trauma. I mean, I had a ruptured, uh, probably a ruptured carotid in the cavernous sinus. We were very lucky that we were able to put some muscle and stop the bleeding. But other than that, uh, I have had never, I mean, I, we have done so much trauma, but we've never had any experience with the cavernous sinus trauma. So maybe it is there and we didn't realize that it is there. Uh, we've had a few cases of traumatic CCF, but uh, obviously these cases had cavernous sinus trauma, but uh, I really don't have much experience with respect to Kevin Sandstrom, as, it, as I told you. Yes, but I, I was thinking maybe we can search and make a meta-analysis and I don't know, we can get something about that because there is a few cases in different places. In Dominicana, I was searching and nobody, uh, because it's like if you have it, you're, you're already dead. Because in in some countries they say people just uh, try try to help. They say, "Oh, he has something in the eyes. Let me get it out." And that's the problem. That's the, the main the, the main problem is if you put it out, because maybe that is making hemostasis. But I think if you have one case, um, I um, you remember what I show you? Maybe we can search different cases and do something. We do intracavernous surgery. We do many times. We do intracavernous surgery. We put in the Parkinson's triangle, and then we sometimes we like to take off the meningohepatocele trunk with the supplying a, uh, with the supplying a fistula or. Uh... Hello. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and I can show you. I mean, I have on big videos on YouTube, on neurosurgical TV itself, how we do intracavernous surgery and how we expose the cavernous sinus. It's part of skull based work. So, but uh, it is not, uh, I mean, cavernous sinus injury is not a big deal, actually. It is uh, only when the cavernous carotid is injured, it becomes a big deal. So, I mean, otherwise, the cavernous sinus injury is, is per se not a big deal. So, only when you have a cavernous sinus, a cavernous carotid injury or a cavernous, cavernous carotid fistula, uh, carotico cavernous fistula, then it's a big deal. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh -huh. then all the pressures uh, change, the venous pressures change, and you you have your uh, pulsating X of the alumnus and uh, going into uh, cavernous sinus like that. Okay, unless you have proximal control or probably even tie off, trap, or even bypass. So it's not easy. Interventionists uh, are much better off doing that kind of stuff, not us. So, yes, there were crazy days when we used to go and do this, and I don't mind going to do that. But when we have better options, maybe we should uh, opt for that. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, Hera. Yes, John. Uh, yeah, we have a question from a. Uh, uh, by the way, I before I got involved with you, I didn't realize you're trying to change the standard of care in, in a major specialty. Uh, but it's been a pleasure, and we'll continue to work with you. We have a question from a Ecuadorian neurosurgeon, Joffrey Portillo. He says, "How many days do you use a catheter in the cistern?" How many? Uh, the Joffrey Portillo, a neurosurgeon from Ecuador, asks, how many days do you use a catheter in the cistern? Five days, five days. Five days, okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Banco, you had a question? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Go I ahead. want to thank uh, Professor Lipe Sherian and uh, about his presentation and uh, i think that uh, what uh, manuel want to, uh, want to say it is maybe sometimes uh, after after traumatic we have uh, uh, sinus cavernous syndrome and who called that maybe it will uh, uh, of uh, sinus cavernous uh, post traumatic and sometimes uh, in my department we have like uh, three cases and uh, we perform endoscopic uh, uh, sorry endovascular uh, management with good uh, outcome so it's not easy uh, to go to to done uh, surgery about uh, sinus cavernous uh, sinus cavernous injury post traumatic sometimes it is fistule uh, and uh, we uh, we perform endovascular uh, treatment and uh, i'm really uh, happy to to be here today 
uh, big uh, and uh, brilliant presentation that is clear. We have also that uh, now, when we have a severe injury, brain uh, post traumatic, we have to think about uh, a good management. And I hope uh, we will go now in our area to perform uh, a mechanectomy the comprehensive with uh, cisternostomy. And uh, I, I have conviction that uh, there will be uh, uh, benef great benefit about our patients. And uh, um, I'm so glad uh, to be here with Lippe Chirian and because I know that uh, in a few months I will be with them we, 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 we <laughs> in Nepal. So I'm really excited about uh, this new experience who, who will come so soon. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you, John, for all you've done to Neurosurgical TV. And uh, you, you, you need uh, to be, <laughs> I don't know, one, one uh, medaille. <laughs> we have to, we have to done you decoration, de decoration. No <laughs> time soon, I, I hope. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Ihira, to make effort to all your effort to make. Thank you, Ihira, and. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, so oh, I have uh, one question, please. Yes, yes, please. Maybe, just uh, just, just a quick one. We have to, yes, yeah, please. Like with the cisternostomy, we don't have a microscope here in Malawi. And uh, I had, uh, when during my residency training, I had lots of exposure with doing uh, uh, sphenoid meningiomas. And I was quite exposed to doing cisternostomies in uh, elective cases but uh, can we do it without the microscope or can we all do it with the using a uh, operating just uh, loops like 2.5 magnification and uh, the ng tube number eight are we going to place it like in between the optic nerve and the uh, carotid artery or should we push it a bit down to the basilary artery so that the csf can have a good output uh, uh, within the five days, it stays in that place. This is a question for Professor Chair. Right. First question: Do you have a car and a house? <laughs> no, like I'm not having that in, in this hospital. I'm just helping out for a few months. No, so. but if you have a car and a house, sell that and buy a microscope. That is my advice to you. Okay. If you have a place to if you have a car and a house, sell that. If you have anything in, anything in your hand, sell that by a microscope. A young neurosurgeon should have that passion. Neurosurgery is not a side business. So be passionate. I'm very happy that you asked me that question. If I was in your place, I will sell everything that I may do another work. If I didn't have that kind of money, I would do something else, I'll buy a microscope because without a microscope, there is no micro neurosurgery. Without no micro neurosurgery, there is no future. Okay? Please remember, if you want to do, if you want to be a micro neurosurgeon, and whether you are in Nepal, whether you are in the United States, micro neurosurgery is micro neurosurgery. You will have the same kind of skills as anybody, any, any best guy in the world, if you practice from this age onwards. But okay. if when you get your money and when you get everything and 10 years, 15 years later, your time for practice and your skills, everything is different. So right now, sell everything you have, get your microscope, start your surgery. This is my answer. Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherian, for inviting me to talk about this. Uh, thank you, to, uh, Dr. David Clark, for giving me uh, the statistics of the current uh, uh, update. So it's already pretty late. It's 12 here in Japan. I'm with Professor Kato, whom uh, Professor Vade described as a mother of global neurosurgery. So, so, right now. so I'll just take you through uh, the, a practical guide to enrollment in India. That's Hira asked the question earlier that whether uh, all the uh, difficulties she faced during organizing this in Nepal. So this is a uh, 
this is the same here as well in India also. But uh, I went through all these difficulties and realized. So I thought I should talk about it. And you know, there are many people who are ready to take this plunge to join in the study, but they just don't know. So I thought I would guide them. So this is my team with the most hardworking team under the leadership of Professor Anil Pitambran and Dr. Raj Mohan. So having uh, the genos has been extended to, to October 2019, as we all know. So I, 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 Professor Vedai on this, uh, just before uh, one year, he had given this talk and presented this slide. He also did uh, uh, present this slide again in this talk. But I think this is the mother of all slides regarding global neurosurgery. Just look at the uh, publications from the developed world and undeveloped world. But the trauma actually lies on the right side of this graph. <laughs> Also, India futures, uh, although we are there, but we are still not there. It's uh, in the top publication of the, <clears throat> among the world. So where does the trauma actually lie? They lie in the developing countries, as we all know. And Asia has tops the list for uh, motor vehicular accidents. And just see, this Southeast Asia is a part where there is largest uh, incidence of road traffic accidents. So why don't we do research? This is a Dutch study which shows that as we go higher up the ladder in the hierarchy, we lose the impetus of doing research. So this is from the last five years. It, this was published in 2015 in Neurology India. You see the number of publications in the last five years uh, tops. Nimhans tops it's in the government sector and uh, Sri Satya Sai in the private sector 13 and 93. So why don't we do research? First thing is I don't have time. Well, that's always an excuse. And second one is I'm not interested better of with clinical work. We can't do anything about it. And the last thing is I don't know how to do it because I was not thought about it. Well, this, has a, this, has, this is the target population whom I intend because there are so many friends who have come up to me and asked that I just don't know how to do it. So I, would, I thought I would guide them. These are the statistics of government medical college uh, where I work. And just look at the number of operations we perform and the publications in last five years. We are nowhere. We are there, but yet we are not there. So the genos is a perfect opportunity for everybody in India to represent the actual figures of a head injury worldwide. So genos so far, uh, uh, these statistics were given by Dr. David Clark himself. Uh, before two days, on he shared with me on WhatsApp. The centers from India zero, despite being, being we were the head injury capital of the world, not so far behind. In, this was in 2003. The Times of India paper reported it. Why this is? This is because the hurdle, biggest hurdle, is the health minister's screening committee. Uh, I'll just take you through how to get past this hurdle. So in India, Health Minister Screening Committee is required for all foreign assistance and collaboration of uh, medical research. And it's a high level committee constituted by government of India, which meets every three months. So these are the ICMR guidelines, which say how to apply for the HMS. In a nutshell, I will show you in a figure that if you're a high volume center, you can direct, directly approach the ICMR. Or if you are, at, uh, or in, uh, in another way is that you can send your ethical committee clearances to a coordinator who would in turn apply it to the ICMR for you. On, if you so click on this site, this is the ICMR website, which will directly lead to the uh, registration. First, you have to register your name here and you will get a username and password. Then you will see this part on the same page below. These are the documents required for this study. And you see the last one document required for HMSC consideration. So the, there are 10 documents uh, required. But when you see this, the number of uh, things you required, you will always say, no way, I'm not doing this. But just uh, you also have a lot of formophobia that is uh, uh, intense uh, discomfort that is experienced in filling out uh, data on a pre-designed template. So I'm someone who suffers from one of the extreme forms of this condition. But when you look back, just chill. Half of the things which are here are not required at all. 
like uh, we do we have we do not transfer any material to a different country so this is not required as well as the last 5 to 10 is not required so all you got to do is a research protocol research that is a research proposal that you already have on the genos website and you have the icmr sem, uh, summary sheet that you get from clicking here and the fourth one is the institutional ethics committee that you get from your own institution so this is the protocol you just click here and you can go directly to the Genos web page where you can download. After you download that, you have to get a covering letter from your head of institution and also you get a consent form, which I'll tell you from where to get. Uh, you approach your ethics committee and uh, institutional review board, wherever it is, and you don't have to alter the protocol. International protocols have to be accepted as, as they are in. You don't have to make any changes in that. Now, after that, what you do is you uh, download, after you getting the clearance from your institution, you go to download the ICMR summary sheet. That I'll let you know what is it. And then with that, you apply for the HMSC clearance, and that's it. So. Well, on, if you click on this link here, you will directly go to the informed consent template page of the WHO uh, website. And this is the one that you need to download. Just click on and uh, you'll get a uh, pre-written pre, uh, pre template of consent like uh, introduction of the study and everything. You have to translate it into your native language as well as English. and this along with the covering letter and the protocol of the genus you have to submit it to your ethics committee this is the icmr summary sheet i was talking about it is a questionnaire of 29 number of 29 questions are asked and this is very simple you just have to go through title of the project indian institutions and all that. i just put on two pages that uh, you got to fill it and there are uh, two more pages which i have not shown here and uh, there you are once you submit it and you go to this page and you can uh, check your status after you view fellowship and HMC and this is what you get and it will show in process. So currently this is the status of uh, our application and we got, did get a call from the HMSC last Monday when they met. So I would request everyone who is in India that this is a golden opportunity let's not miss the bus yet as uh, now the hmsc will again meet in uh, three months that is uh, august and you have two more months to complete this study so uh, any help regarding this in india i am more than willing to help though i am not uh, holding any official position in the geno study but i feel that this is very important this uh, to truly represent the actual numbers within which this study is to be based so thank you very much for inviting and uh, uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really helpful the way you've guided because uh, honestly, it's, it's a bit of a problem for countries like Pakistan and India to get approval from institutional boards and go ahead with performing research. Even if you are willing to, then you have so many hurdles already. Yeah, so, that's yeah. Thank you so much for highlighting this. Welcome. And, Welcome. and Dr. David, would you just put a small comment on this and then we'll just wind, wind up? Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, yeah. uh, Dr. Raja. I really appreciate that. Like I was saying You're earlier, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. It's, it's quite difficult to get HMSC approval, yeah. so I appreciate um, you spending the time. Um, and yeah, really hope that a lot of centers from India participate because, as you say, it's one of the biggest burdens of TBM. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Any? I think that's all for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Raja. Thanks to Professor Yoko Kato for recommending. Yeah, thank definitely. you. So thank, thank you all. You.